Good evening, everyone. My name is David McGowan. I'm the CEO here at WJCT, and I am so delighted to welcome you here. It's been a long time since we've had these kinds of events, and it's just so great to see so many of you here. Um, before I introduce our esteemed guests, I do want to say uh, a couple of thank yous. Thank you to the Community Foundation of Northeast Florida for supporting this event and helping making it possible. Thank you to our First Coast Society members here who make almost everything we do, in fact, everything we do uh, here possible. And thank you to all of you for supporting WJCT Public Media this evening and for coming out. Michelle, I think you need no introduction to many people here, but like I'm going to do it. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, Michelle, you are best known to people here as the weekend host of All Things Considered, but uh, you're also a podcast host and a correspondent on Amanpour, which is seen on our Jack's PBS television service here. Uh, and you came to NPR, I think, in 2006 mm -hmm. uh, as the host of a daily program called Tell Me More, which ran for a number of years. Uh, and came to NPR after a, a career spanning print and television from ABC News. Uh, and you spent time as a White House correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. That's actually when you and I first met mm -hmm, mm -hmm. back sure in D.C. when I was the executive charge of Washington Week in Review and you were a regular guest on that program. So we, we have that in common, a long history in, in public media before we were even in public media, some mm -hmm. of us. Um, so let's just start by asking you to tell us a little about yourself. You were born and raised in Brooklyn. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you all for coming. It's great, it's great to see faces, all of them. Uh, and also thank you again. Um, without you, there is no us. Um, the late, great Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman elected to the US Congress. She represented a district next to mine in Brooklyn. Uh, she was not my family's congressperson, but she was the district next to ours. She had a catchphrase, unbought and unbossed. She said, I am unbought and unbossed. I work for you. And I like that catchphrase. That's ours. I think we can have that. We are unbought and unbossed because of you. Um, so you are the reason that we can do the work that we love and think is important. So if nobody else has said thank you today <laughs> to you, let me say thank you again and again and again. Uh, do love those sustainers, though. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you to all of you who make this work possible. Um, we, we are not beholden to any one person. No one person can be mad at us and decide that we have to go away. I've actually seen that happen. Uh, a, a colleague of mine was working for a wonderful startup media project. Um, it, you know, he, it, it was a great idea. It was bilingual. It was binational. It was meant to kind of bring sort of elevated you know, coverage to issues of particular importance to the um, binational Latino community. And they had a major funder who picked his head up one day and realized they were going to do real journalism and shut the place down within a week. And so, thank you. Um, Brooklyn, New York, yes. My father was a firefighter. Um, you know, I tell people that, you know, we, we, we are people, if you ring a bell, we come. You know what I mean? Like, that's like the family <laughs> trade. Half of my relatives were police officers, including my aunt. My aunt was one of the first black women to wear a gold shield in New York, if you know what that is. She was a detective. She was one of, she's in the police museum if you go. Um, and, you know, you know my, I tell my, my dad says he's the black sheep of the family because he started out as a police officer and became a firefighter. So he said he couldn't take it. So if you want to know how that happened, like insert New York accent here. There's meat eaters and there's grass eaters, and I figured out I'm a grass eater. <laughs> and, uh, and remember, this was at a time when, he, when the mortality rate for firefighters was actually higher than police officers. You know, the building, you know, infrastructure, right. you could fall through a roof. My dad fell through a roof, broke his leg. I mean, I have two, both of his helmets. One of his helmet, the first helmet, has like all these dents in it from when people like threw bricks at his head during the 60s, you know, riots. And then the second one, you know, which is much more sort of pristine when he became an inspector. And, um, 
but he just, you know, felt he, he, he liked to save people, mm -hmm. you know? So you, and my brother was a firefighter also, yeah. And you went from So Brooklyn? I guess my sister and I, we're the, we're the outliers. Like we, <laughs> we're like the, you know, you know. <laughs> You're not firemen. No, we're not firefighters. Although we do kind of put out fires. <laughs> so you, you went from Brooklyn to mm -hmm. boarding school mm -hmm. and then to Radcliffe, mm -hmm. when they still called it Radcliffe, mm -hmm. I think. I don't know. I don't remember. What, I know my what, ring is Radcliffe, but that's just, you know, identity politics. So that's what. What drew you into journalism? You know, um, I think it's the same thing that drew my dad to fighting fires, you know? I liked the excitement, and I liked feeling like we were helping people. And I liked the fact that if you told people something, it made them feel seen, mm -hmm. you know? I think it, it sort of, it does both things. You tell people something that they didn't know, and that's exciting intellectually, but you tell people something that they already knew but didn't know how to understand, and that is, I think, very impactful emotionally. And I think that from the earliest, I was just, attracted to both of those things. Mm -hmm. it's, head, it's a head and heart business at its best. Now obviously, and I think, I, I assume we will talk about this, um, people, I think, one of the things that aggrieves, I hope, all of us here, and I know you and I have talked about this, is the way that people have weaponized people's emotions for the purpose of not telling the truth, but of winning. And so, you know, clearly, there's a lot to be fixed in our business. But at the heart of it, I think it's a head and heart business mm -hmm. where hopefully you appeal to people's heads, that you touch their souls, and at its best, it helps us see each other. Does that make sense? It does. I think it's interesting to hear you describe it as exciting work, because mm -hmm. my memory of early days in journalism was, was I, was, I will tell you, was not exciting. Really? Uh, it was a lot. It, You're in the wrong business. Well, may I, Wait, what, what were you doing? What, what uh, were you so doing? I was doing a lot of drudgery. I was pulling a lot of wire copy. I was oh. doing a lot of research for, uh, for people. I worked at Time Magazine uh, earlier in my career. Well, see, that's was, why you need to start local. Because that's where you, well, that's let's where talk the, about that. That's you, where the fun stuff you, is. You started, and that's where you do everything, right? Yeah. So you started local. Tell us about that. You know, um, I started out as an intern at the Washington Post, and I, you know, I tell this is in, everything I'm about to do is absolutely true. I graduated. I did, see. I'm from New York. Okay, so those of you from New York know that cars are very expensive, and it's Dad's car. It's not your car. It's Dad's car, or whoever has to get to work. It's their car. It's not your car. You're not driving that car. So I, like, I'm sure a lot of you probably learned how to drive when you were like 15 or whatever. No, that's not how, no. So, um, it's terrible. I shouldn't admit this, but I'm gonna admit it. So when I got my, um, the application for the Washington Post internship says, do you have a driver's license? And I assumed the preferred answer was yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, you know. <laughs> I'll check yes, and if I get this internship, I'll learn how to drive. And so I did get the internship, and I thought, yay. And I thought, oh, no, I have to learn how to drive. <laughs> so I, I, I think I scraped together like the last $200 of my scholarship money, and I paid some retired shop teacher from McKinley Tech to teach me how to drive. And this is the truth. And I flattened his tire on my first day. And he made me change it in front of all my classmates going to class because the only time I had was like at seven or eight in the morning before class started to take my lessons. So I went out at like 7 a.m. I tried to park the car. I parked too close to the curb. I flattened the tire. He made me change it in front of all my classmates going to, going to uh, class. And, and I'm like, you know, like that. And so I'm really glad he did that because like my first week at the post or two, I took out what they then had radio cars because we didn't have cell phones. So I flattened the tire, I have no idea. <laughs> and uh, I knew how to change it. And I come back to the 
newsroom covered with dirt in my like one good outfit triumphant. And they're like, what happened to you? And I was like, I had to change the tire, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so I graduated June 5th. I took my driver's license exam June 6th. I drove to Washington June 8th. I started at the post on June 10th. So Getting it done. Getting it done, getting it done. And um, you know, my first story that they sent me out on was, I know I'm sure many of you have read Malcolm Gladwell's work, you know, who's a, a, you know, a fine writer and wrote about how like you need 10,000 hours to be good at something. I don't know whether that's true. I don't know whether the 10,000, I don't remember. But you know, I have to admit, I wasn't very good at first. And uh, they, my first story they sent me out on was, uh, there, was a, there used to be a live poultry uh, store literally down the street from where our office is now. It was called Arrow Live Poultry. It was meant to serve uh, Chinatown, which was two blocks this way, and it also served the Halal community. And it was the, a target of a demonstration by PETA, which was when it, in its infancy, okay? So they were demonstrating outside of the live poultry place. So I go there and I interview the demonstrators and you know, I interview this people, I come back and my editor says, what's the, you know, tell me. And I said, well, they, you know, they're out there demonstrating. They said it's mean, you know, to the chickens and chickens are smart and blah, blah, blah. And he says, is it? I was like, oh. And I went back out there, across town. And uh, he said, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you, is it mean to the chickens? And uh, he's, I don't think so. It's okay, okay. So I go back to the thing and then write up my story. So yes, and then, yeah. So I wasn't very good, but I stuck <laughs> at it. My other favorite was like this guy named Alfred E. Lewis. You know, do you all remember Rewrite Men? Do you remember this, Rewrite Men? Like those of you of a certain uh, generation will remember back in the day that were like reporters and rewrite men. Mm -hmm. And the reporters would be out in the street and they would phone in whatever. And there was a guy who would write you know, the copy, Alfred E. Lewis had been like, he was like a, he was like an institution at police headquarters and they took me down there to meet him because I was gonna work the night shift because everybody had to work the night shift at some point and he, his, his one bit of advice to me is, you got a pocket full of change, honey? Back, they talked to people like that back then. They probably still do, but uh, you know, <laughs> but probably not to me. And then they'll be like, you got a pocket full of change, honey? I'm like, I don't think I always carry a pocket full of change. Digs into his pockets and comes out with like a fistful of nickels, dimes, and quarters and slams it into my hand. That's all you need. <laughs> and, um, but here's why I really appreciate those opportunities is that, you know, it's, um, you're, it's people's lives. Like I remember one of these stories where they sent me, I was working the overnight and a little boy, had fallen out of the window of a, of, one, of a housing project. And I was like, oh no. And they were like, go find out, you know, what happened. And I really don't want to knock on this door. And I must have driven around the block three times. If I take a deep breath, and I go to the door and I knock on the door and I say, I'm so sorry, I'm from the post. Can you tell me what happened? And she said, where have you been? I've been waiting for you, okay? And the reason I tell that story is that a lot of people think, you know, like we're like vultures, we're just like, you know, pecking at the carcass of people's misery. And, you know, and I've been confronted a number of times with people who, you know, like, you know, how dare you, you know, go and, you know, you know talk to these people when blah, 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 how dare you? And you saw, you know, at the, that terrible school shooting in Uvalde, where a number of people took it upon themselves to keep the journalists from covering the funerals. They had decided, you know, it was like some combination of hell's angels and people who had empowered themselves to protect the people from the media because they had decided that they shouldn't be there and that this was exploitative. And I go back to that moment and say, this woman, if I hadn't come, it meant he didn't matter, okay? So, I raise that to say that often our views of what matters depends on who we are mm -hmm. and where do we think we matter? Do our stories matter? And if we don't show up, does it mean we are invisible, okay? So 
I go back to that because I think that that is so fundamental to what we are trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. We are trying to not just tell people about their world, we're also letting people know if they matter. And I think that's why the work that you're trying to do, that you all are trying to do here to reinvigorate local journalism is so important. Well, let's talk um, about that for just one second. Uh -huh. And I, I'm uh -huh. glad you gave me the opportunity to give a shameless plug for what we are doing here locally uh -huh. and for uh, Jacksonville Today, which is our kind of digital first uh, local news effort and you've got a big sign over there and, and an opportunity to sign up on your table and I encourage all of you to do so if you haven't already. But Now you worked in journalism at a time and I think it's still largely true mm -hmm. when you worked in local journalism many people yeah. um, especially uh, in the big cities with the hope of working in national journalism right and today we have a landscape in yeah. which there's an awful lot of national journalism right, right? and there's a very very little bit of, uh, of local journalism. And we all, many of us know that story and why that's happened and the withering of our local newspapers as, they, as that business model has changed and they've been absorbed into large companies. But can uh, I just stop you just briefly? Friendly please. amendment. I'm not sure that everybody does know that's happening. No, because I agree. Because a lot of what people see are these ghost newspapers that look like a newspaper, but it really isn't. It doesn't really have any real local reporting in it. Oh, and I, so I guess what I'm saying to you is I think the first challenge is that a lot of people don't know that that's happening. I think you're absolutely right. In fact, you know, and, and this is something I talk about in other forums quite a lot, where mm -hmm. you Pew uh, Research Center does a lot of great research on this. Mm -hmm. You know, they, if you ask most Americans how their local newspaper is doing, they think it's doing great. Um, there is not a, a, a widespread awareness, actually, of the hollowing out mm -hmm. of the newsrooms that have populated, you know, American cities um, for generations, and with that, mm -hmm. a loss of not only the reporting, but all of the things go along with that, like people's ability to get informed about what's happening in their cities where they live, their ability to have governments monitored, officials monitored, uh, wrongdoing ferreted out. And we've seen now in study after study the effects of that hollowing out. Well, let me document. just say that the, 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 what, what I think shocks people if they think about it, because they don't really think about it. I mean, think about it. Do you think about it? Are you saying, you're thinking, wow, gee, you know. Um, no, you're living your life. You're like, you're getting your dry cleaning. You know, you're trying to figure out. But then how does it happen that these issues that are nobody was talking about five years ago, two years ago, three years, all of a sudden have taken over the country taken over library boards and school boards. How did it happen that the urgent need to ban one newspaper article, the 1619 Project, which is one book and one newspaper project, this became an urgent national concern? How did that happen? How did it happen that there was an urgent need to keep children from reading about Rosa Parks or Frederick Douglass? How did that happen? It happened because nature abhors a vacuum, and at national interest groups with a political agenda, an ideological agenda, have come in where there is not the kind of relationship that people have with their civic institutions because they have nobody to mediate it. Like, I'm thinking, like last night, there was a, um, we have in DC, we have these little groups called ANCs, Advisory Neighborhood Commissioners. They had a meeting at seven o'clock last night. It was on Zoom because still COVID. People were like, I got to pick kids up from school. I got to get to soccer. I don't have time. I want to watch the Emmys. You know, like, I don't have time to go. What? So that's what, the, that's what the newspaper's supposed to do for you. They're supposed to be places that you are living your life. <laughs> They're supposed to represent you. You know, can you imagine? It's like if you, you have, like, the, those of you who are still in that parenting phase, or if you remember it, the parent-teacher conference, right? You know, how often would one of you say, if you, if you, if you were in a two-person household, one of you would say, hey, oh, man, i got to work late. Can you cover me? Can you cover me? Right? That's what we do. We cover you at these meetings that you can't go to. What happens when there's nobody to cover you? What happens? And there's actual data that shows that literally the cost of bond issues goes up. Voter participation goes down. Uh, community distrust deepens. This is real. This is real. And I don't fault people for not knowing. But now that you know, 
now that you know you, this cannot be ignored. So this is very real, and I understand why people don't, because they're living their lives. But, but this is a reality that, that interest groups have taken over that vital civic function of helping us understand what's going on in the world. And, it is, it's, and I, the only thing I would disagree with what she said is that you, know, you go into local news thinking that you're going to be a national part. I didn't. I just wanted mm -hmm. to be good at it. I mean, part of it is because I blew up in a blue collar household. My dad was a firefighter. You know, my mom worked in a store. They read all the newspapers. Neither one of them had had the opportunity to graduate from college, but they were literate. Like, they read the paper. They wanted to know what was going on. They always took us to vote with, you know, I'm sure you all had that same, I'm sure a lot of you had, like, whenever they would take, they would go to vote and it seemed very mysterious and complicated. You know, they had the curtains, you know, and, and the, because there were three of us and we all couldn't be in there, you know, you had to take your turn and, you know, and they pulled the curtains and then they would doop, 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 doop. And imagine, you know, how disappointing when I get to DC and it was like this little slip, it was like a dry cleaner slip. Like what the heck, what? This is all I get? This is what? But, you know, it was a big deal. And they read the papers religiously, all of them. And so, I just wanted to be good at it. I didn't have this notion, oh, I'm going to be a White House girl. I didn't even, what is that? I just, <laughs> it's so funny, it's terrible. But I remember when my dad, um, um, I shouldn't tell the story, because I don't want anybody to get in trouble, but when I was getting married, my dad, um, I was able, I, I had a friend on the door at the White House, I'm just going to say, what was the Secret Service guy. I'm not going to call his name, because I don't want to, hopefully he's retired. But he let my dad come in. And because um, I had a hard pass so I could get in, but I was like, my dad's here. And so he's like, just like, <laughs> so he let him go in. And my dad, any of you firefighters, my dad never went anywhere without a giant knife in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, dad, what are you doing? And because you might have to cut your way out of something, okay? Like, that's okay. So he had this giant, and Terry's like, what is this? I was like, dad. So he's like, I'll keep it up here. <laughs> sure enough, the, what got me is the president actually came out and had a surprise meet, a press, it wasn't really a press conference, but like, availability is what they call it, and availability, it's, like, it's not all the chairs aren't set up, it's like he wants to say something, they, everybody rushes out, so I was like, Dad, come on out, come on out, he goes, and he's like, hey, hey, I was like, I know, it's right there, he goes, it's the guy from Channel 2. <laughs> <laughs> Guys of Channel 2. <laughs> and, I'm, and Rand, poor Randall, he's there. He had been a local reporter in New York, and he's there, and he sees my dad going, hey, hey. And he goes, and I was like, hey. See, okay, yeah. I'm yeah. just saying yeah. to you that I just wanted to be good at it. I just wanted right. to be in it. I wanted I to be part of it. So, but I do agree with you that the opportunities that we had to learn, to move through the chain. I mean, I, I started out covering like the births of interesting zoo animals and you know, the zoning, more, the, all the stuff nobody else wants to do. And then I covered the county council and then I went to the state legislature and then I got to cover a statewide race. And then after that, you know, I did my time covering one of the federal agencies, counting the minutes mm -hmm. to how bored I could possibly be. And then I got See, it wasn't break. all exciting. It wasn't all exciting, no, but I mean, but, and then I got somebody, somebody literally was, somebody was covering a presidential campaign and started having some health issues and couldn't, didn't, did, couldn't, didn't want to be on the plane, what we call a plane jockey. Right. And they were like, do you want to do it? I'm like, yes, I really do. And thinking that I would never get a chance to go to the White House because the custom then was the, the person who was covering the candidate that won would continue to right. cover them at the White House the candidate I was covering lost, so I said, well, that's it for me. But then it turned out that the person who uh, was considered the senior person at the White House at the time was George H.W. Bush, was very foreign policy oriented, did not really want to cover domestic policy. And they were like, do you want to do this? Yes, I do. And that's how I got to do it. I want to shift gears for a minute now and talk yeah. um, a little bit about what you do now. Mm -hmm. um, take us inside the show a little bit and what your week is like. You have such an incredible range of topics that you cover on the weekend, all things considered program. I mean, just this weekend, it was, you know, the death of the queen, the Ukraine war, 
um, how to make a vegan meal, right? It's, it, it's such a range. Mm -hmm. I, I just think folks would be really interested to know, how does that all come together? Well, um, my work week is Wednesday through Sunday, so I'm here on my day off, you're welcome. <laughs> um, um, you know, we, the thing, you know, I, I think that every show has an identity or should. And I start out, whenever I take on an assignment, I try to rethink it. Like, I try to think, what is this for? This is the one time I will probably quote Newt Gingrich, um, who said back, you know, back when he spoke to mere mortals like myself, um, I mean, he was in Congress. I covered it for years. It wasn't hard back then. Like, there wasn't this like, hierarchy of, I will talk to you because you are on my team, and I don't talk to you because you're not on my team. Back then, everybody talked to everybody. And what he said was, a standard for anything, practice or policy or institution should be, if you weren't already doing it, would you start? If you weren't already doing it, would you start? And I personally think that that is an excellent guide to thinking about what we're doing. And so whenever I get a new assignment or I'm asked to do something, I ask myself that. If we weren't already doing it, would we, would, should we start, would we do it? Would we? And so when I was asked to take over Weekend All Things Considered, that was the question I asked myself. And um, obviously I'm not the only one who gets a vote. <laughs> but, but I asked myself, what is this show for? Who's watching it? Who would we want to watch it? Why are they watching it? What is it for? And can we offer you something that isn't just, like you could just turn on the CNN and get the same thing? Because my attitude is, and frankly, frankly, it's not, is, are we just the executive summary version of what Scott Simon reported that morning? I don't know. I mean, I, like why? Mm -hmm. that's, so that's kind of my guiding principle. And because we have the opportunity to be on the weekends, um, part of what I do is curation. You know, is what is the, what I try to say to myself is, what is the most important thing that you may have missed? And can I tell you something more about it mm -hmm. for Saturday? And on Sunday, I think, what is the most important thing I can tell you about what's coming up? And then I sort of fill in from there. And then also, frankly, some of it is like, what is my staff, what are they interested in? Because one of the things I say, that because sometimes, you know, we'll have, you know, interns or who come and work with us and they'll say things to me like, are you interested in X? And I'll be like, why, first of all, if this show is only what I'm interested in, it would be pretty boring, thing one. Thing two, if we're all thinking the same thoughts, why do I need you? <laughs> like, and like, like, no, I didn't say that to them, because that would be me. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, you could just see like the little tears. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say that. But I'm thinking that. It's not about what I'm interested in. It's what can you encourage me to be interested mm -hmm. in. And if you can't encourage me, then maybe you don't care that much, you know? That's part of it. I'm like, what else? Like, for example, I'll give an example. This is a young woman. She's working for here and now now, so I feel really, you know, happy about that. She, she, she was obsessed with The Bachelor. I could so <laughs> care less about The Bachelor. I, I, I pride myself on how little I have watched The Bachelor. <laughs> But she's obsessed with The Bachelor, and she was like, are you interested in The Bachelor? And I, my first thought was, N who? <laughs> but I was like, <sighs> but America tell cares me why about you, The Bachelor. Tell me, no, tell me why you care about The Bachelor. And what's so fascinating to me, she's a first generation immigrant. She comes from a very intellectual, you know, she's not at all, like, I don't know what image people have, like, she's not like sitting at home and her pink fluffy bedroom watching this, thinking this is gonna be her fantasy. She's just obsessed with it. And I didn't realize it was like a whole bachelor nation and all this. And so this being NPR, we found a woman who is both a scholar of The Bachelor, thank you very much, and who's also a of fan. Of course we did. Of course we did, and she's also a fan. She actually watches it. And so I was able to say to her, why do you watch this thing? What is it about it? You know, and, and it's so funny because I knew I had succeeded when people who I don't know like email to say, I really cringed when you said you were going to talk about The Bachelor, but it was so interesting. <laughs> so that's how you know you've succeeded. Because she yeah. told me something like I didn't, like, why do people care? Like, why? Do, I, I think it's so gross. It's like these people <laughs> kissing these people they don't even know. <laughs> I guess maybe most people kiss people they don't even know, now that I think of it. But anyway, you see the whole point. I mean, I've been married for 20 years. Like, the whole idea of, like, ugh, 
just uh. So you've worked in radio now for quite a yep. while, but you've worked in every yeah. other medium. Yep. Mm -hmm. Except print magazines, I've never done that. Mm -hmm. I got you Everything covered else. there. How do you, how do you feel about working on the radio? I mean, what is it about the radio? I think, you know, there's a lot made in NPR about, you know, weekend moments and that kind of sure. thing. And there is something to that, right, to, to the intimacy of radio. How do you think of it when you're on the air? Well, I can tell you, I got very good advice on this from a ver veteran broadcaster in Washington um, who told me, who had also worked in television, and what he told me is that television is to the room, radio is to one person. And I have always adhered to that. That's why you will never hear me say, you all are guys, you people, you out there. I never, no, it's one person. Because, because I frankly think that's how most people are listening. They're, they might be listening in the car, like with other people in it. In fact, a number of you were nice enough to tell me that you've indoctrinated your kids by you know, having the radio on while they're in the car. We appreciate it, which we, I love a captive audience, especially the ones in the car seats. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> We want to do it, um, but I mean, he—he—he—he. He, 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 it's true. I, I think there's something to that. Like television is to the room, but mm -hmm. often you're in somebody's ears. You know, you're in their ears. It's very intimate. I think I try to remember that. And then also, particularly when I had a midday show, because often things were like, tell me more, things are happening like literally right before you get on the air. And so I warn people sometimes, you're going to hear something loud. You know. I mean, sometimes people think, like, it's interesting, some of my, um, my younger staff think we're being patronizing. Like when we tell people there's sexual content coming or disturbing, say they think we're being patronizing. They're telling, grow up, people should just, you know, and I just disagree. I feel like, here you are, you're on your way to the store, or you're just, you know, I don't know, something might have just happened before you got in the car, you're going, whatever, whatever, and then, I'm going to tell you about somebody just being eviscerated. Like the Ukraine coverage, some of it is so heartbreaking. I feel on a human level a responsibility to tell you that I'm going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. That's just how I feel. I don't think television is the same. We generally don't. I mean, sometimes they do because particularly in times of war, the images are so graphic. You, but, you know, we have a very sanitized media in the United States. I mean, just as a fact, we don't share a fraction of the kinds of imagery that people in other media enterprises around the world are exposed to. But I personally feel like if you were to, like you were kind enough to pick me up on the way over here, and I, you know, you're going along, and, and if you were to say, you know, how was your day, and I were to say, I just got a very upsetting phone call, I wouldn't just launch into this terrible thing just happened. I would say, David, I'm gonna, I have some upsetting news. And I just think, it's, it, this is just, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I have a lot of opinions about how, you know, so forgive me, <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about, about that. But like when I, when I hosted Tell Me More as a daily show, one of the things I would say to people, don't leave people devastated. Don't let the last thing that people hear from us be something that breaks their heart. Give people some hope. And I would say, and I, people can like it or not like it, or they can think it's corny, but I personally feel that our, I think that the world is so stressful and it can be so unkind that if people give us the courtesy of inviting them into their personal space, I feel the least we can do is honor that space and have a little bit of gentleness about how we introduce things that cannot be avoided. I mean, you can avoid it, you can turn us off. I'm like, nobody's under subpoena here. All right. I mean, so I tell people that all the time. Nobody's under subpoena here, but I just feel, and I understand that people disagree with it. Sometimes people get annoyed. They think, like I said, we get letters from people all the time saying, why are you being so, you know, but I'm like, because it's my show. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit. You mentioned the differences between mm -hmm. television and radio. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit and ask you about mm -hmm. um, this crazy uh, media world of 2022 mm -hmm. um, that we live in. And there, you know, there have been a lot of observations over a long period of time about the differences mm -hmm. in media and the way it affects our democracy, right? Marshall McLuhan and mm -hmm. Neil Postman and a lot of media critics uh, are talking about this. And I think, you know, famously, the kind of politicians that tend to do well in a television world are, t are, are, are politicians that 
um, that are likable on television. That's, that's one of the things that's, that's been said. I, I want to posit a theory um, mm -hmm. on you, which is I, I heard recently from someone who um, I admire who said, you know, in our social media world, actually, um, it's pretty good to be likable, but it's really good to be unlikable. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the energy and the passion that that kind of uh, unlikability generates. Of course, it generates likability and passion among a group of supporters, but actually the, positive, the energy that's generated by the controversy itself and by provoking uh, folks into not liking them is also actually uh, useful to them. You actually, uh, I think, kind of in a recent interview, you, you asked a question about, I think it was the, the uh, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. race, and saying, you asked your guest whether this was an intensity election. Mm -hmm. And it struck me, it made me think back to this, um, to this theory. What, what, what's your thought about that? Do you, you think know, there's something think to that? It's a dynamic, I think it's a dynamic question, and I think that it's one that we have not, we don't really even fully understand. I, I, I think that the likability standard has gone out the window, frankly. Um, people can you know, argue with me or if they want to, but I think that 2016 proved that likability is not relevant to um, effective public discourse if you want to win for mm -hmm. people winning. I mean, I think that there have been political movements throughout history that have demonstrated that charisma and likability are not the same thing. And so um, I think that that argument of in, in fueling outrage is one that um, is one that I think that's taken over all media, frankly. Really? So I you don't you don't see not, that? It's not no, a social media no, thing. No, I do you not. Think no, I do a... not. I think social media weaponizes it. Mm -hmm. Social media weaponizes it, but the outrage machine is one that um, I think has been taken over by all broadcast channels. And right. I think that at NPR we're fighting against a, a wave. And the question, I mean, it's interesting because... You, the, we highly the, prize civility in our corner of the business. It is not highly prized. No, it's uh, not, but we've done that for a long time in the media. As you say, television has done that for a long time because the, the controversy, the heat of the argument, it, it makes for... It, the. Right, it used to be said, that makes for good TV, so we, we did it. Um, and I think the, th the thing that I was interested in, in trying to understand is, I don't know if candidates have ever felt that, that their own, <laughs> you know, their, the venom that was spewed at them was, could actually be productive for them in helping them win. It depends on whether candidates are serious people or not, or they just want to win. I mean, there's candidates are not all the same. Candidates are human beings, and they all come in different flavors. And some people are very interested in policy, and some people are very interested in winning. And some people are very interested in both. I mean, obviously, politics is the means by which government happens, right? OK, so yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't look down on politics. Politics is the means by mm -hmm. which government happens. There's two choices. It's words or weapons. Those are the choices, right? So you either win by, you know, might or you win by words. But the problem here is that, um, you know, who can be the most outrageous, right? And when people don't have other basis to evaluate people, this is, it goes back to what we started our conversation with, is not, local news is not the answer to every question. Because look, again, there was no golden age of when the news was perfect in this country. Yeah. Please, I mean, please, please, please. The newspapers in this country have motivated lynch mobs. Newspapers in this country have, this is a fact. I mean, come on, like, you know, there's a project, there's a really interesting project at the University of Maryland where teams of, multiracial teams of reporters, I think it's very interesting how they've constructed this, of student journalists are going back to their community newspapers, if they still exist, and re-reporting some of these racial atrocities and going back and trying to find, like, what happened? Why was it constructed in a certain way? Like, there are those of you who've ever dug into this area, you know, it will break your heart. I mean, people act like mob violence directed at marginalized people is like a few bad apples. Well, how is it a few bad apples when you have a thousand people showing up to a lynching that was advertised in the newspaper? So this is a fact. And I'm sorry that some people want to outlaw facts or the learning about facts, but the facts will not 
disappear. And, you know, what is it that, you know, Ronald Reagan said, facts are stubborn things. He was right. And so, so newspapers, there's not some golden age, but, the, but of where everything was perfect and everybody did the right thing and all this other thing. I mean, there's a very long and interesting history of the relationships that different papers in the United States have had with the political parties and with ideological groups and how they were used for political agendas. I mean, those of you who are history buffs, I'm sure you know about the Spanish-American War and how it was basically the invented construct of some people. I mean, they just made the whole thing up. Everybody, those of you who are veterans of the Vietnam era, you know about. So, so, but what I am saying is that we are in a moment where it's very hard, you have to be very motivated to break through that noise. Mm -hmm. And let me be very clear, we are not perfect in public media. Let me be very clear, we are not perfect. We have done all the things. I mean, we do not participate in the outrage machine. That's not our brand. That's not our mission. And again, as I said at the beginning, because of you, we don't have to chase the clicks. Our life does not depend on it. But we've been, we've been you know, guilty of not seeing whole parts of the world. We've been guilty of not seeing our neighbors, people who live right next to us because we didn't see them. They weren't our folks. They weren't our people. You know, so, but we at least are trying to push against that culture of outrage for the sake of outrage. And, and, and again, like I'm not, you know, saying that my, our friends, our friends, our colleagues in the commercial media love this. I think they're all, everybody's paddling and as fast as they can and they're not sure where they're going. Yeah. I can tell you, remember, I was in commercial television. I was working at ABC during the O.J. Simpson trial. And I remember one by one as everybody clicked on to the Bronco chase. Do you all remember that? I know I'm dating myself, but and I remember thinking, what is happening? I mean, I had just come from newspapers, right? So I was like, what is happening? Like, what is happening? And I remember thinking, why are we doing this? And it was almost like if you went back and asked people, why are we doing this? Because they're doing it. And so it becomes the circle, the cycle of, you know, mm -hmm. this is what we're doing because everybody's doing it. And um, this is where I, I think a lot of people are looking at trying at different models of, of ownership to create different incentives. And, you know, think about it. We were, you know, GoFundMe before GoFundMe was cool, <laughs> right? I mean, this model of, look, you give five and you give five, Hopefully you'll give 10, <laughs> 25, <laughs> 50. So that means that no one person can decide that this is our reality and that we can all hopefully seek truth together. But, um, and that is why you'll see outfits like ProPublica, which is an investigative uh, group that, um, but they don't have their own distribution platforms. They have to basically go around and find a paper or a partner to distribute their content. Um, you'll note that there have been these huge, uh, big multinational investigations, like have you heard of the Pandora, Pandora Papers? They've done a, a job of figuring out where often dictators and autocrats are hiding their money around the world. And because so many of them live in places where the wrong story will get you killed or arrested, that's why they spread the, the, the information around newspapers and news outlets around the world so that no one group can be shut down, hoping that at some point the truth will come out. So I guess what I'm saying to you, David, is we have not figured this out, but we are trying. And um, you are trying, we are trying, hopefully you will help us try. I'm hoping that this next generation of people will take an equally, um, you know, there was a whole, remember the whole Woodward and Bernstein generation, everybody got excited about investigative journalists, again, because Woodward and Bernstein, and then people realized, well, everybody can't do that, and then now I'm hoping that people will get interested again in both local news, but the, the business structures that allow it to thrive. But they're not the only, I'm just going to say, news, we're not the only ones struggling with this. Like with those of you who are in medicine, you realize there's a whole generation of so-called general practitioners, right? GPs, internal medicine, who are retiring. So now it becomes a matter of specialists. Well, how would you know what specialist you need to go to if you don't have some sort of a gatekeeper? I guess what I'm saying is there are lots of institutions now that are going through this kind of disruption. And 
I, all I ask is that within your lane, you do what you can do. And all I ask is as, as citizens and as conscious people, do your part. Don't pass along rumors that you don't know to be true. Just do your part. Don't pass along, you know, through whatever social media outlets you use. Don't be part of the problem. You know, one of my, um, some friends, that, people that I'm friends with, the News Literacy Project, they say practice good information hygiene. Like, remember, we've all had to relearn how to wash our hands. Like, I didn't know you were supposed to do all that. Like, <laughs> We had to relearn that because of the current environment that we're in. Well, the environment we are in now, we all have to practice good information hygiene. And it is very comforting, of course, to be validated in your views all the time. I mean, who doesn't love that? You know you're right. I think you're really right. <laughs> These other people are better. Everybody loves it. But, but that's not what we need as citizens. So I, I want to ask you about uh, about something, which is uh, again uh, Ezra Klein, who many of you may may know, um, said something which I really found interesting about um, the need for media that allows you to change your mind. Right. Um, you know, it, it's it's true. I think that no matter what your particular sort of problem in the world is, if it's climate or it's mm. poverty or it's inequality or whatever it may be, there seems to be, you know, a vast gap between what we sort of think we should do and what most of us acknowledge we will do. And the thing that is especially infuriating is that if you tell people that, well, you know, this is what you should do, it just makes the problem worse. It makes people... I think, react in a very negative way and, and dig in and entrench themselves. And that's part of the polarization that we see today. And yet we've got to acknowledge somehow that, you know, the secret of politics is, you know, you got to be able to change people's mind in order to change politics. And I wonder how you think about that as you, as you do your stories, as you, I, I think all the time about maybe it's just a, a product of getting older, mm -hmm. that I'm actually much more willing to change my mind now about a lot of things than I was 20 or 30 years ago. I, well, I, I wonder how we, how we present journalism and media to people in a way that allows them to actually consider things, think about them anew, and potentially change their mind, because it seems like what's required. It's a difficult question. It's more difficult than it seems, because, because we are presented now with not just a matter of different, part of the battle in America today is a battle over narrative. And it's not just a matter of fact. It's a matter of fact, interpretation, and in some cases, outright falsehoods, okay? So in a situation where you have somebody, say, insisting that the crowds at his inauguration were the largest ever in history, and since I was there, and have been in Washington for some time and have covered many demonstrations and many gatherings that were bigger and I know and can see with my own eyes, including any of you who also can see, and there's satellite imagery, and there's people whose job it is to count crowds, and there are people who with expertise in this matter who all say the same thing. Is it, is it, is it, is it, is this, is this service a good service to present that with equal weight See what I'm saying? This is the problem. Because some people would say that it is. Some people would say, your job is to is just go, it's A, he says A, he says B. Some people think that's our job. Yeah, I mean, and there, I just don't. Well, there's, and, an, you know, there's an interesting conversation about this in media I'm sure, you know, yeah. happening right now because, and I'm not sure, this may be a little bit of inside baseball with what's happening at CNN right now with mm. the change of management, right, and, uh, and, and the sort of fear that what's being ordered up by the new bosses is kind of this classic, what we call both sides journalism, right? I don't, see, I and, don't know enough about what they're doing. See, I don't, I, I understand what you're saying and I understand why people are afraid of that. I just, I just don't know whether it's that I'm just trying to or get they to that think question. that they've gone too far to interpreting not just the balls and strikes, but the motivation of the pitcher, you see? It could be that. It could be that, so but, I and, and I just use, use um, CNN as a proxy yeah. because there's been a lot of writing in the media uh -huh. about this uh -huh. recently. But this question of 
legitimacy to both yeah. sides, right? I mean, it, it, I think it's, it, it's fair to say that there was a time when um, it was almost automatically warranted to give both sides in a political debate some measure of, of, of coverage or attention. Um, not, not necessarily, you know, it was always a journalist's job to evaluate the legitimacy of mm -hmm. those views and whether they had some basis in fact and to present that to, to readers or listeners or viewers. Well, but that seems to have changed now. Okay, and friendly amendment. There's a st friendly amendment. Okay. When Richard Nixon was first, you know, portable handheld tape recorders became widely accessible during the Nixon-Kennedy campaign. When Richard Nixon first saw a New York Times reporter, because the New York Times had money then, and was, they were often the first to adopt new technology, when saw the reporter with the handheld tape recorder, he was furious because he realized that people would actually know what he said, okay? So all I'm saying is this push and pull, by, like, so therefore people who were, he could say whatever he wanted mm -hmm. in these closed group, and then like who was gonna you know, dispute it. And now there was, just like with photography, just like with other technological innovations, the problem we have now is these same technological innovations can lie. We have you know, artificial intelligence that can make, like those of you may have seen, this image of Nancy Pelosi that was distributed all around social media that made it look like she was slurring her words, like she was drunk at a public event. She was not. It was, complete, it was manipulated to make her look that way. Um, it's, it's, it's just a fact. And so I guess what I'm saying is we've had these periods before where people were fighting over narrative. This is not new. What is new is the means by which you can weaponize falsehood has become so accessible and so easy that it's not just a matter of certain people having access to this, it's a matter of lies spreading literally around the world. And we know for a fact that there have been mob attacks on people based on lies on social media. Thankfully, in this country, only one, but uh, in recent years, but in other parts of the world, you see my point? So it's, it's just, it's, I don't wanna leave us, in, you know, this is the thing, I've said I don't believe in leaving people devastated. What I think is that, I think that we as an industry, we, we have a lot of work to do. I, I have a reading list for people if they're interested. I mean, obviously, you, you mentioned Ezra Klein. I think people, if, if you are so inclined, I would love it if people would read Margaret Sullivan's book. Mm -hmm. It's a small book, it's called Ghosting the News. It's like slender, it'll take you, if you're a fast reader, it'll take you a couple hours. If you're a slow reader, it'll take a couple days. Chris Steyerwalt has a new book. Or Margaret Sullivan's book is called Ghosting the News. It's about this whole question of local news, why it matters so much. And she has the receipts. I mean, she has the, she has the data on why local news matters, not just from a standpoint of civic um, you know, goodness, but how it really affects your bottom line. But I also am reading a book, Chris Steyerwalt's book. You know, those of you remember, he was the political director at Fox and he was fired for correctly calling Arizona for mm -hmm. Biden. That is a fact. And he also just recently testified before the January 6th committee about the pressures that were being brought to bear. He has a lot to say about his sense of, he started also in newspapers, and he has a lot to say about how he thinks the technology has accelerated what he calls the rage machine. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is, it's not your job, but it is all of our responsibility and to the degree that I can persuade people like you who by your presence are showing that you care about these issues to participate in these conversations, it's too big of a job just for us. I'm sorry, I wish it were different. It's too big of a job just for us. And um, just like we all can't just leave healthcare to the doctors because it's all of our responsibility, this is all of our responsibility too, to figure out how we communicate with each other about the things that matter most. I wish it were different. I wish you and I could just like sort this thing out right now. <laughs> but, um, but we can't. What I can promise you is we will do our part. Mm -hmm. But I can also promise you we cannot do it alone. And there are so many things like just, um, there's just so many things that, you know, support. It's like, it's like if you're picking your wine, right? I mean, I'm not trying to be, I, you know, you, what do you do? You, you, you get the best wine you can afford and you leave the garbage on the shelf, right? So leave the garbage on the shelf. <laughs>
We're going to turn to your questions in just oh, a have, minute. Oh, we have questions. Um, Can I have your so, water? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Help yourself. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I noticed you weren't drinking it. <laughs> I, I, do, I flew today. I flew in today, so I feel like I'm like. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a, a kind of a related question, mm -hmm. um, which is, do you think we have a problem with bias in the media? We're human beings. All humans are flawed vessels. But I mean, is it a problem? Is it a problem in, in, in the and, way and, that... And how do you mean that? Do you mean it as a personal character flaw of the individuals doing the work? Or do you mean it as a neurological phenomenon that is inescapable <laughs> I think, in human I think beings? I, I think I mean it as neither of those. Really? What, what, what do you mean? What, what, tell me. What, what I mean is, if you have, uh, if we accept that everyone has biases, um, but that a, uh, a balanced and nuanced view of the world is best created by having a diversity of backgrounds, a diversity of opinions, a diversity of perhaps uh, political orientation. Do you think we have a problem with bias in our newsrooms I, in America? I think the structures of media now and in, in the current moment whatever the personal proclivities of the people doing it are, tend toward polarization, whatever your personal opinions are. Because I think that um, in terms of bias, right, um, I think that a lot of people think that the legacy media is by and large liberal. I would argue that in the current, it, how can I put this, if you were a surgeon, could you do surgery if you couldn't stand the sight of blood? My attitude is, if you're a journalist and you can't stand hearing other people's opinions that don't comport with yours, you can't do it. I don't see it as any different. Does that make you a liberal? No, it makes you have professional discipline. <laughs> and I think, like, do, you know, if you're a dentist and you can't stand teeth, you're in a world of hurt. So I just think that this argument that people, you know, of a certain sort of generation in, in media are biased, like the New York Times and are organically biased because everybody's a political liberal who all voted for Dukakis when nobody else did. I'm sorry, I just think it's that it's certain, if to, to do the work the way it has been done in the current environment, you have to have a tolerance for different points of view. You can't do it. Like if you're a person who, and you know everybody's got an Uncle Fred like this, right? Who's like the minute, it's like everybody's got an uncle like this, is like the minute you think, oh, you know, you know, Johnny's, you know, come out and told us that he's, you know, that he's gay and he's got a friend and it's this and, and he's coming to Thanksgiving and Uncle Fred's got to let you know why that's wrong and he's not going to, up with which he will not put, you know, that you can't be, no, you can't, you can't, you're sending him out to go talk to people. <laughs> that, I'm sorry, everybody can't do this. So I think some of it is just, it's professional discipline. It's a certain personality type that is, if you're, if you're interested in all kinds of people as opposed, or all kinds of situations as opposed to somebody whose primary instinct is to judge and condemn, you're not gonna be attracted to this. That's different from somebody having a political agenda which, who says, my get up in the morning and my goal is to make my team win, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I think there are certain news organizations where that is the overriding goal one in particular, I'm sorry. That's the overriding goal, make my team win. But it's not necessarily, that's, what's, that's one of the things I found so fascinating about Chris Starwalt's book is that um, he suggests, I don't know, I've never worked there, but he says that it's not even really that way, it's that the incentives are so directed in that, law, in that way that you, you get, it's the undertow, it's the mm -hmm. undertow, it's, you just get pulled into it. And that if people were in a different stream, they get pulled into a different stream. I think that's an interesting, you know, argument. I think that in terms of, you know, I don't see how you could not need diversity in a newsroom. I don't see how you could possibly do your job without it, or at least do it the way it should be done. I had a very painful, interestingly, I had a very painful conversation with one of my former bosses, frankly, just this weekend, about the coverage of some, weirdly enough, it was about um, coverage of the royal family, and thinking back to my time in his newsroom, and how disempowered I felt 
as the only female correspondent and the only correspondent of color. And I said, now, you know what? Like, Prince Charles marrying Camilla, then Prince Charles, was portrayed as this beautiful, you know, middle, late in life love story. I said, but as the only woman in that newsroom, right, to me, it was like this powerful middle-aged man using this young girl as a brood mare, and then when he was done with her, threw her over the side. That's how it felt, but nobody cared about, you know, mm -hmm. and he was shocked. Like he had no, you know, and I said, and I said to him, I said, now, and now I'm really telling you all the inside. And I said, and could it be that, because there's so many middle-aged men in our newsroom who are having affairs, that, <laughs> could it be? that that's why this was the preferred narrative. I mean, so I guess what I'm saying to you is that, you know, I said, I said to him, the reason I'm raising this with you is that you are now teaching, and I really would appreciate it if you ask your students who gets to tell the story, and why do they get to tell it, and whose voice is missing, and why is it missing? And I just don't see how you cover the world as it is without at least an appreciation of whose voice is dominant, whose is the loudest voice, and who is not being heard. I don't understand how you think that's fair. Now, the fact of the matter is that some of these newsrooms only diversified in terms of racially because, you know, like remember Eleanor Roosevelt, remember famously, Stop talking to male reporters. She wanted to make the newspapers hire women. She said, I'm not giving interviews to male reporters, sorry. So they had to hire women, hello. And in fact, during the era of the 60s activism, some of the black radical groups would not talk to white reporters, or some of the white reporters were afraid to go talk to them. And so some of the newspapers had to hire black reporters. And, but in that instance, they weren't trying to Yes, they were looking at people who they thought would better understand them, um, but they weren't trying to obliterate other narratives. The problem I have now is that you have people who want to obliterate other narratives. They want to criminalize other narratives. They want to make it impossible, and I, that is to me is unacceptable. So what I'm not looking for is replacing, you know, one set of bullies with another set of bullies. I'm not looking for replacing one set of kind of smug self-righteousness with other smug self-righteousness. But what I am saying is I don't understand how if a diversified financial portfolio is desirable, if biodiversity is desirable, how is intellectual diversity not desirable? So. Let's use that as, a, okay. as an opportunity to open up to some questions. I think we have some uh, microphones in the room that will be uh, brought to you. So if you are interested in asking a question, um, please do and let Hopefully us it's know. not a fitness contest either. <laughs> like, like I, <laughs> yay. How much time do we have? Just so I know how to, we when have do you about, We have about 20 minutes. Okay, great. So I just need to know how to calibrate my answers, so. See, this is so funny because like most of my job is listening. So like, I'm like, nobody asks me questions. I'm like, oh wow, like I got to talk. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Mm. Um, I have a oh. question about local news. Mm -hmm. And so we work at a foundation and we have been working to try to create a sense of urgency around what we see as the crisis around local news. And my challenge has been, why should people care? Because I, I cannot figure out how to make people care about this and to create a sense of urgency on why individual people should fund a nonprofit news entity. So any thoughts? That is that? a tough one because I feel like the proof is in the pudding. You know what I'm saying? Once people see that it's useful, they will be interested. Success breeds success. So um, that is a tough one. Um, if there's anything I can do to help you, I'm glad to do it. I have two kids in college, so don't be looking for money, but I will definitely show them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show up, but I'm not going to, you know. But I think, it's, I think the proof is in the pudding. I think success breeds success, and once people see something is valuable to them, they tend to want to support it. Um, and I think, you, you know, forgive me, I don't, I don't know what particular area you're interested in, but one of the things that I've observed breeds um, loyalty is when you, 
you pick something. Like, you know, and those of you who play, this is terrible, I'm using a golf metaphor. Can you believe that? I'm like a black girl from Brooklyn, I'm using a golf metaphor. But, you know, pick your club and swing it. Like, if you, you pick an area where you can add value and add it and then build from there. Like, I, you know, I had a, a, an, an intern who was um, at a college paper and he was an editor and he was really frustrated because he was used to running the whole deal and then poor guy shows up in my newsroom and he's like doing whatever. And I said to him, I said, look, if you can cook a whole chicken, you can cook a chicken leg, right? Find the chicken leg and cook it. <laughs> and he, to his credit, I say, I, this is, I love this kid. He called me up during the next election. He goes, I found my chicken leg. <laughs> because what he realized is that nobody was covering like the little, the precincts right around the university. So he sent his reporters to cover it. And people were happy about it. So that's what I would, find your chicken leg. That's what I would say. And if I can do anything to help you, I will do so. Where, next. No, okay. two, two questions, uh, softball and the hardball. Okay. Do you write most of your dialogue? And uh, secondly, what can the world do about Putin and what can journalism do to help that? Well, the, um, which was the softball? Which was the <laughs> <laughs> No, well, I, I am not, like, this is terrible. Henry Kissinger once said this joke about my friend and colleague, Ted Koppel. He, he hates it when I call him my boss. I don't know why, like, he was my boss. I could fi he could fire me, I couldn't fire him, so he was my boss. But he hates that for some reason. But anyway, my friend and colleague, Ted Koppel, Henry Kissinger said that Ted's fondest wish was both to ask the questions and answer them. <laughs> um, but as to the dialogue, I do not write the answers. <laughs> but yes, I do. I don't write all the introductions, but I certainly put my hands on all of them because people need to, you know, if somebody brings me a guest, I need them to basically have vetted the guest and I will go back and, but in terms of my own, what I say, yes, I write that myself, or at least I edit it uh, myself. And I don't choose all the guests because like, as I said, like I, I can't know everything, and, um, but I certainly approve them all. And there are people that I, you know, I, sometimes I have to go back and say, this happened a couple of months ago that somebody picked a person to offer expertise on a subject. And I looked a little bit deeper into that background. And I said, well, I said, you know, why did you, I, I asked my staff, why this person on this topic at this time? If you can't answer those three, then come back when you can. But this person um, had a record of anti-Semitic comments. And I was like, I, you know, if I said, look, you can't really cover, if, 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 you're gonna, if you're gonna write about race, you're gonna interview racists, that's the way it is. And if you're gonna write about anti-Semitism, at some point you're gonna interview anti-Semites. But if the subject is like anthropology, why are we interviewing this, no, like this man, his anti-Semite? What, tell me why. And they were like, I didn't know. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, it, it takes a village. What about Putin? It takes a, what about Putin? Like, well, the question was about um, what's happening in Ukraine, how journalism can help uh, I think that was the question about how well, you know, can help the situation. In I Ukraine. have been really moved and impressed by the vigor of the reporting and the, the yeoman's efforts that people have made to get the truth out. We have a telegram channel. We have Russian speakers. We have, um, we are st broadcasting our news on Telegram, which is a social media channel that a lot of people in Russia get. We are doing whatever we can. We, and not just us, this inter international consortium of journalists, as I've spared, shared, trying to get the truth out and still keep our people on the air and not and out of jail. I mean, that is real. You know, people, you know, like we're trying to keep Charles out of jail. Charles Maines is our correspondent in Moscow, and he did a terrific piece for us this weekend about how Magically, you know, pro-Kremlin forces have been able to criticize the recent um, offensive in Ukraine, whereas anti-Kremlin individuals, it's, it's against the law and you will be arrested. So um, we are just, I, I guess what I would say is we're staying on it. And um, I don't mean to, God, it's a terrible expression, beat a dead horse, that's an awful expression. I don't mean to keep hammering on the same nail. Is that better? Um, <laughs> but it is your support that allows us to protect him and to protect other journalists who are doing this difficult work, both legally and with you know, the appropriate um, equipment. 
for example. Like, I mean, I went into Romania. I promised my kids I wasn't going to cross into Ukraine, you know, because they had, you know, it's just I promised them I wouldn't, you know, it, you know, like. But as I was saying to David earlier, now it's now they're both in college. It's their turn to wonder where I am and what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, um, but your your support is why we have body armor. Your support is why we have security consultants. Your support is why we have people that we can call 24 hours a day if we're in trouble and need to get someplace. Um, there, we've had, as you know, colleagues killed overseas doing this important work, and we remain overseas doing this important work because you allow us to do it. So that we are doing our best, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question over there. Yes. I often wondered how you managed to keep balance in your segment, Barbershop. Did you know all of these people or did you have a group of individuals to give you background, to give you an inkling of how to ask questions? Mm -hmm. They were always, that segment was entirely, to me, very informative and well balanced. Can no, you explain you. your- I appreciate that. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that because one of my goals with Tell Me More was to bring people who weren't like always, you could hear everywhere, you know what I mean? And sometimes when that happens, they're not gonna be great. So I had certain rules, which is you have to, you gotta mess up twice before we dump you. You know what I'm saying? You, because everybody's not always great their first time out and sometimes people mess up or they don't know how to work the time. So yes, we had a, basically a lot of scouts. One of our kind of key people, Jimmy Israel, was kind of a talent scout for us, and he would try to bring people to our attention. I am really excited about the fact that Nick Charles, who is now our culture editor at NPR, was one of my early guests on The Barber Shop. So, you know, and so giving people an opportunity to be good is one thing. And this is something that I also, particularly about women, that one of the things that used to irritate me is like, you know, during the Iraq war, you know, you'd have four generals and they'd all be men and, you know, cause, but there are women who have expertise in defense matters. And so what they would call her up with like half an hour's notice and she'd run into the studio and be like out of breath and they'd be like, oh, she wasn't very good. So really? Because you called them up a week ago and they had like five days to prepare. So one of the things I try to do is when people aren't experienced talkers, give them an opportunity to get good. And if they mess up, you, you gotta mess up twice before you get dumped. Like, like this one guy, he was really, really popular blogger in New York, but every other word, forgive me, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> so he just couldn't adjust to our vibe. But so thank you for that. It was one of my proudest things. I think we brought lots of new voices who you would not have heard otherwise, many of whom have gone on to be very successful. Like there was a guy who later became a full-time on-air person at, at uh, ESPN. He'd never been on the air before. I mean, I, have, I can tell you there are a number of people that I brought on who'd never been on the air before. There was a woman who named Janet Mock who has become an internationally known transgender activist. She was one of the writers and producers of Pose, if any of you are fans of that show. I am literally the first person ever to interview her. And so, well, thank you. I'll receive that. Anyway, all I'm saying is I feel part of my job is to bring people in who aren't already there. And sometimes when that happens, they're not going to be great at first, but to give them that opportunity to be great. So. Okay. You have a question over there? Okay. I'm wondering your thoughts on the uh, yeah. influence of journalism and entertainment in three minutes or less. <laughs> yeah, well, it is there. Look, look, look. Some of the fame, you know, people forget that Mike Wallace started out as a game show host. Hugh, da that's true. Mike, Hugh Downs started out as a game show host. The, the late, great, feared Mike Wallace, the, you know, CBS newsman extraordinaire, started out as a game show host. Hugh Downs started out as a game show host. Walter Winchell started out as a, a, a publicist for dancers on Broadway. I mean, he later became, you know, he was one of the most powerful. He was like the Rush Limbaugh of his day. So there's always been a relationship between broadcasting and, um, 
entertainment. Like Diane Sawyer was a Miss Young America or something like that. Miss Jun America's Junior Miss. She started, she started her career as, uh, and then she got a job as Richard Nixon's assistant when he was living in sort of post-presidency exile. She was like his secretary or an administrative assistant and somehow like, you know, Megyn Kelly was a lawyer. She wasn't in entertainment, but you know, you could argue there's an element of razzmatazz in lawyering. My, la my husband's a lawyer, I can say it. So um, there's always been a relationship between entertainment and journalism. The question is at what point do you adhere to the values that make journalism what we expect it to be. Listen, in the United States, journalism is a craft. It is not a profession. There is no test that you take. There is no license you put on the wall. You can't be arrested for impersonating a journalist. And if you could, I have a list. <laughs> but, but that's our system, and we prefer it. I mean, there's no licensing board. You know, in some countries, you know, there's a licensing board. We don't, that's not our, we don't believe in that here. Because, so that's where you get the whole citizen journalist and who's a journalist and who's not a journalist. It's, it's, that's our system, it's not going to change. But I will say that, again, like I was saying to this lady here, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Are these people serving a constructive purpose? Can you trust them? And you know, that's where I get concerned, is that just the entertainment value cannot, should not overwhelm, is it true, is it fair, is it right, can you trust them? And so um, that's where I get upset, is that people I feel like who have earned your trust, and I've, we, I say this to my interns all the time, like, you know, we get interns every semester and I say, you know what, it has taken me a long time to earn the trust of this audience. It can take, and I don't wanna lose it. So it, it, you can, it takes a long time to earn, it's very easy to lose, so, you know, have my back, so. Mm -hmm. Right there. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, uh, NPR or WJCT, bring the event here. Uh, I told you earlier, Michelle, mm -hmm. uh, I and my son pretty much listening to you in the car every day. Now he's uh, out of college and working in San Antonio. So we are also a big fan of uh, NPR. We listen to NPR every day. Uh, I have many questions, uh -huh. but uh, I, I guess I have limited time. I just <laughs> ask one, only one. Have one, right? Just one. But most uh, you know, int uh, relevant to myself in my life as an Asian American, uh -huh. um, I am passionate about uh, helping people to live a better life and uh -huh. I promote uh, um, lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. So I, I have an organic restaurant, we make organic food. Mm -hmm. I often say I wanted to make the meals that help. So my question is not related to food, but related to Asian hate. Mm -hmm. So and from geopolitics, our country has war with China. And last of uh, five years, we have a Chinese project and profile Chinese born scholars, professors, students who live here. And they brought them to, you know, to, to the court. Some has issues, but 80%, 90% just profile them. And they all uh, dismiss the case. And the other one is that our media has bias reporting about China. Everything about China is bad, 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 bad. Nothing is good from China. But I often say to my friends, I just think about it. If everything is about, bad about China, but they outlived 600 million people from poverty in 30 years. I said, this is something that as American, we can learn from them. So we can brought those stories, the good stories that we can learn, how we can deal with our poverty, our homeless people on the streets. So my question is that. Mm -hmm. How, as you know, NPR, we all trust, trust media in our country. How we can do to make the reporting more balanced and then to help our country, help our politicians to make the better policies to outlive our poverty and the homeless mm. populations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, 
understand what you're saying. Um, I agree that there has been, um, that racism has been weaponized against people of Asian descent and that it has been a very frightening time for people. Um, I believe that this isn't solely a media problem. This is also a leadership problem. I don't think you could ignore the fact that the President of the United States used racist terminology to refer to a disease which knows no ethnicity. Um, I personally have seen what you're talking about. I have colleagues who have experienced this. I have uh, one of my older girls, I have a blended family. One of my older girls is a hospital-based physician and has described like the harassment that people have experienced, which is, which is appalling in any context, but particularly appalling when you have people who are trying to save people's lives. As a person of color myself, I completely understand what it means to be profiled um, and how dehumanizing this is. On the other hand, it is a, also a fact that the current regime in China has made a diligent effort to shut down public discourse and free reporting. Um, I have a former colleague from the, I don't want to say which news organization, a pro, an organization that I reported for previously, who was ejected from the country, had to flee um, because of her reporting, fair, accurate, and honest reporting. It is a fact that the current regime is trying to do in China what Putin has tried to do more quickly and dramatically in Russia, which is to criminalize reporting. This is just a fact that reporters have had their licenses revoked, their access to the internet's been shut down. Censorship is real in China. It is a fact. And so the, the fact that the doctor who tried to call attention to the COVID virus was literally arrested and questioned by the police, subsequently died of COVID when he was trying to just to warn his countrymen about it, those are real stories and they have to be reported. And they have to be reported for the sake of people in China as well as for the rest of the world. Because if we don't give people in China the opportunity to tell, if they don't have the opportunity to tell the truth about themselves to themselves, then there has to be some outside force that's willing to do it. I go back to that woman I talked about whose son fell out of the window. I think that's an apt metaphor for autocratic regimes around the world who are trying to silence the voices of their own people. That woman said to me, where have you been? And I cannot say in good conscience, I don't want to say, there are whole millions of people around the world who will say to us as Americans, where have you been? Where are you? And so I think that what you're saying is complex, um, but I feel as a journalist, it's important for us to stand with those who want to tell the truth, even when it's painful. And I think that in the long run, that um, that is a greater service to people in China right now and other people who are living in environments where access to information is not free. As to the question of people, the mistreatment of their fellow citizens, uh, that is a stain on our country. And I hope that all decent and ethical people will do what they can when they observe this injustice occurring and will, you should not be alone in this, ever. And I think that people who are not Asian uh, and see this kind of behavior going on have a duty to stand with you. Do you have one last one over there? First of all, I'd just like to tell you that I'm a big fan of yours and also, yeah, you Oh, me? I was going to say, oh, okay. And uh, with newspapers going out of business all around the country and the price of a newspaper going up, what do you say to a young student that wants to become a journalist? Because are there many jobs? Is the pay worth it? Is the time worth it? And the second part of that question is how many newspapers are headed by African-American males around the I country. Can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear the second but Are there many? Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. How many newspapers around the country are headed by African-American males? 
You know, I don't know. I mean, the fact is they, the, the first question is, well, I'll end with the second question. The first, the, I'll end with the first question. The second question is how many are headed by African-American males? I don't, I mean, the LA Times is the largest that I can think of. LA Times, Kevin Merida is the executive editor of the Los Angeles Times. Um, New York Times until recently. New York Times until recently. This is Dean Bacay. But, I mean, Kevin Meredith is a great journalist. He's been at the Dallas Morning News. He's been at the Post. He started this um, project at ESPN called The Undefeated. Um, he's, I think he is probably the most prominent African-American male newsroom leader that I can personally know. I know that at the Post there, there's a generation of rising stars uh, at NPR. There, is a, there are a number of people like, who are very well positioned for leadership. Like as I said, Nick Charles is now the Culture Desk editor who's just doing amazing work. Um, there's a, uh, the head of our visual team is expanding you know, exponentially. He actually left NPR and came back, which tells you something. Um, um, I mean, the shrinkage of newspapers is a real problem. Like the Denver, the Denver Post was headed, had an African-American man who was the executive editor. Um, the Globe, at one point, had a, the Boston Globe had an executive editor, at least one of their top editors. But the shrinkage of newspapers is a serious problem. But if you're asking me what I would tell a young journalist, I would say we need you. I would say it's not a, it's, if you are, if you have the inclination and the skill and the desire, I would say your country needs you. It's not just that our field needs you. I would say our country needs you. And um, just like, and I don't you know, mind if people do this work for a certain period of time. Just like we offer our thanks and congratulations to people who wear the uniform of the United States, we don't necessarily expect them to do it forever. But if they do it for a time, we thank them for their service. And that's the same thing I would say to a young journalist who comes at this with, the, with what I consider to be the right mentality, which is I'm here to tell the truth. I'm not just here to win for red team or blue team. I'm not here to decide what's right and then find the facts to fit that narrative. I'm here to tell the truth to support my country. And I thank you for your service. And that's what I would say. And I mean it. So in, in closing tonight, I just want to invite all of you to take up Michelle's invitation and learn more about what we're doing and about how you can become knowledgeable, not only about what's happening in local journalism, but what's happening in your community. You all have um, some material uh, on your tables in front of you that invite you to uh, learn more and to sign up for Jacksonville today. Uh, which is a, an email newsletter, which is really the start of what we're uh, of what we're doing. We have a big ambition in this space, and we hope that we can count on you to uh, participate and to support it. And finally, I want to say to you, Michelle, thank you so much for being here on all of our behalf. Thank you for sharing thank you. yourself with us and for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, and good night.